Did the Tower of Babel actually exist? Where and how did the world's languages originate? Where did the nations of the world come from? As we study the book of Genesis, we discover what the world was like when God first created it and what followed. In the previous studies, we considered the world up to the flood of Noah's day. In this study, we will examine the biblical account of the Tower of Babel, and then we will look at how languages and people groups developed. This is not intended to be an in-depth study of the world's peoples and languages. We will simply be looking at the biblical account of their origin. The Tower of Babel. Where do all the languages of the world come from? How did they originate? What does the Bible say? Let us consider that God made the mouth, the ear, the brain, and the ability to communicate. Therefore, God himself not only has the ability to communicate, but he is the best communicator. Let us see what he has to say. When the flood was over, God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and replenish the earth. So God's clear intention was for them to disperse so that the whole earth would be populated. And the whole earth was of one language and of one speech. And it came to pass, as they journeyed from the east, that they found a plain in the land of Shina, and they dwelt there. Did Noah's descendants obey God's command? No. After a period of approximately 300 years, instead of dispersing throughout the earth, they chose to settle in one place in willful disobedience. Why did they do this? They wanted to build a tower to reach God. And they said, Go to, let us build us a city and a tower. Who we'll stop may reach unto heaven and let us make us a name. Lest we be scattered abroad upon the face of the whole earth. Here we see a manifestation of man's pride and disobedience. People wanted to make a name for themselves and that this name be immortalized. This was contrary to what God had commanded and it brought swift retribution from him. And the Lord said, Behold, the people is one and they have all one language and this they begin to do. And now nothing will be restrained from them, which they have imagined to do. Go to, let us go down, and there confound their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth, and they left off to build the city. Therefore is the name of it called Babel. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth, and from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. So we see that God judged man by dividing their single language into multiple language families. As these groups spread out and became isolated, Certain features, skin shade, eye shape, etc., became dominant in certain groups, creating distinct peoples and further separating them from one another. Over time, people not only sounded different, but started to look different as well. All humans came through Noah, and prior to the flood, ultimately, Adam and Eve, which means that we all have a common ancestry. We all belong to the same 
human race. However, after the Tower of Babel, it becomes increasingly difficult to ascertain where everyone went. Let's look at the genealogy of Noah. He had three sons, Ham, Shem, and Japheth. Generally, from the Middle East, in the land of China, modern-day Iraq, where Babel was. Japheth's descendants went toward Europe. Ham's went toward Africa. And Shen's remained in the Middle East. Moving to the surrounding areas, the Bible does not give us much information, and it is difficult to find exact evidence of who went where from these places. From Ham came the Africans, Babylonians, Philistines, Egyptians, Ethiopians, Libyans, etc. From Shem came the early Chaldeans, Arabs, Jews, Armenians, Syrians, Persians, Iranians, etc. Jesus Christ is a descendant of Shem. From Japheth came the European peoples, the Germans, the Balto-Slavic, the Celts, the Italians, the Hellenic, the Armenians, etc. Semitic languages have a very long history and they are the languages of peoples, mainly in North Africa, the Middle East, and several parts of Asia. Other language groups also have a long history, but apparently not as long as the Semitic languages. Most of the language groups appear to have originated around 2000 BC, which is consistent with the time of the Tower of Babel approximately 300 years after the flood. Secular historians tend to date many language groups to about this time. Bible scholars and Christian historians have suggested that the development of language supports the biblical position of an original common language because it is shown that languages lose quality over time. Therefore, the evidence of history and science supports the view of an original common language that was very rich and diverse. As people dispersed from the Tower of Babel, they likely adopted various elements of the common language, which is how we now have several major language groups. For example, the ancient alphabet of the Ras Slavic letter, consisting of 49 characters, was first reduced to 43 letters, then to 38, then to 35. Today, there are 33 letters in the Russian alphabet. Originally, the language that God created would have been the most beautiful, as well as the most complex languages evolved from it, becoming simpler and of a progressively lower quality. An obvious example of this is English. If we compare the language of the King James Bible, Shakespeare, or Jane Austen to today's English, the decay is sadly evident. Language groups. The Semitic languages are the languages of the peoples who are the descendants of Shem. Ham's descendants settled mainly in Africa and speak Hamitic languages. Japheth is the forefather of Indo-European peoples and languages. Indo-European languages include German, Greek, Italian, Russian, English, Irish, and Celtic among many others. Russian, for example, has similarities to other languages of the Indo-European group, although different languages 
have retained different parts of the original language. Let us compare the Greek, English, and Russian alphabets. The diagram shows the interconnection and overlap between these three, with the middle section showing just the letters common to all three languages. The letters may be read differently, but there is still a connection. Let's look at the cyclical nature of God's work in relation to humanity. Cycle. The Lord God gives a revelation to man. God gives man commands. Man disobeys. God judges him. Since the beginning of our course, we have covered 11 chapters of Genesis. Let's summarize the periods we have considered so far in our studies. The period of innocence, Genesis chapters 1 to 3. The revelation of God, the Garden of Eden. God reveals himself as the creator, creating man in his own image. He settles man in the Garden of Eden to cultivate it and to keep it. Human responsibility. The man is charged with the commands to, one, replenish the earth with children. Two, subdue the earth. Three, have dominion over the animals. Four, care for the garden. And five, abstain from eating the fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Man's disobedience. Adam and Eve deliberately disobeyed God. They followed the devil and ate the forbidden fruit. God's judgment. God will always judge disobedience. The punishment of the first period of innocence is death, separation from God, and man's banishment from the garden to a life of toil and pain in a cursed earth. The period of conscience, Genesis chapters 3 to 8, the revelation of God, God promises a savior and that the seed of the woman will destroy the devil and be wounded in the process. Human responsibility. Man is given a conscience along with the knowledge of good and evil and a way to approach God through the sacrifice of an innocent animal. From that point, man has lived with a conscience. Man's disobedience. We see man's disobedience highlighted in Cain's murder of Abel. The spread of polygamy, despite the fact that in the beginning, God created one woman for one man, and the thoughts of the heart of man becoming thoroughly corrupt. God's judgment. God sends a flood to destroy all life from the earth, saving Noah and his family because of Noah's faith and obedience. The period of human government. Genesis chapters 8 to 11. The revelation of God. Human government is introduced. God promises there will never be another worldwide flood and gives the rainbow as a sign of his promise to mankind. Capital punishment is introduced. And surely your blood of your lives will I require. At the end of every beast will I require it. And at the hand of man, at the hand of every man's brother, will I require the life of man. Whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. For in the image of God made he man. Human responsibility. No and his family are commanded to replenish the earth with people. They are given dominion over the animal creation and are allowed to eat meat. Man's disobedience. People refused to disperse and there was total disobedience to God expressed in idolatry and solidarity 
to build a great monument for themselves. God's judgment. God brought the construction to a halt, creating different languages and enforcing his command to fill the earth. The result was the rise of different nations and cultures.